Thanks to the overwhelming success of movies like Blade, X-Men, and Spider-Man, the 2000s were packed with movies adapted from comic books. While the 90s was loaded with lesser-known comic adaptations and independent titles, it wasn't until the mid to late 2000s that comic book movies became the juggernaut we have today. While recognized characters like Hulk and the Fantastic Four were getting movies, some studios were trying to make their own original comic-style creations. This wasn't anything new, with the first being Abar, the first black Superman, all the way back in 1977. What was new was the frequency of them. Movies like Sky High, My Super Ex-Girlfriend, Lightspeed, and Hancock were being released as a way to capitalize on the superhero craze without having to deal with any rights issues. Around that time, producer William Vince read a script called Push. It was about a group of rogue psychics trying to evade the clutches of an evil government organization called The Division. The script was different from so many others he'd read. Vince was the founder and president of Infinity Features, a production studio based in Vancouver, Canada. Vince loved the script and sent it to director Paul McWiggan. McWiggan was just finishing Lucky Number Slevin and was looking into what his next project would be. He read the script and was intrigued. After finishing, he did a Google search for psychic powers experiments. He read about how after World War II, Russia and the U.S. conducted experiments on brain power. This sent him down the rabbit hole as he read more and more on the subject. He discovered a long-running project called Stargate, an experimental study by the U.S. government on creating and controlling people with special abilities. With such an intriguing premise, he let Vincent know he was on board to direct. He appreciated the script for being quite a bit different from many of the superhero films we've been getting. Instead of characters with powers like flight or super speed, this had people with various mental abilities that were somewhat based in reality. They wanted to add a layer of authenticity to the film, so they hired Dr. John Alexander as a consultant. Dr. Alexander worked in special operations for the U.S. military, but was now retired. During the Cold War, the Soviets were investigating psychic phenomenon, so the U.S. followed suit and did their own experiments. These experiments were not universally accepted. Some of the higher-ups involved considered it the work of the devil. At this time, Dr. Alexander was working as part of the Intelligence Committee of the Army that explored psychic phenomenon. They were looking to unlock the untapped potential of the human brain. Dr. Alexander helped to tweak the script and kept things from getting too far from their foundation. They laid out the different types of psychics to be established in the film. Watchers have the ability to see visions of the future. Movers can use telekinesis to move objects with their mind. Pushers can implant memories into others to manipulate them. Bleeders can emit sonic vibrations that can burst blood vessels and rupture organs. Sniffs are like psychic bloodhounds that can smell something a person touched and track them across great distances. Shifters can temporarily alter the appearance of objects. Wipers can either temporarily or permanently erase the memories of a person. Shadows can block the abilities of sniffs so they can't find who they're looking for. And stitches can heal someone or use their powers to unheal the same person. They wrote a set of rules they had to abide by, so if there were any rewrites that occurred during filming, they'd be able to keep things consistent. They wanted to make sure as to not contradict themselves or rewrite the plot into a corner. With the foundation in place, they started casting. The lead character of Nick was originally going to be Channing Tatum. They instead decided to go with Chris Evans. Initially, they were worried, since Evans had already done superhero films twice, with the Fantastic Four and Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. However, McWiggan saw Evans in Danny Boyle's Sunshine and knew he'd be perfect for the role. Dakota Fanning was hired to play Cassie Holmes. She decided to do the film because it was unlike anything she had done before. She was also given free reign to develop the look of her character, including the colored stripes in her hair and wardrobe. For the villain Carver, they hired Jaiman Hansu. With his enormous frame and imposing presence, he was perfect for the bad guy. While in pre-production, the director did some location scouting. He decided the perfect place to film the majority of the movie would be in Hong Kong, China. The lead character Nick wanted to disappear, and what better place to get lost than in a location where people were literally stacked on top of each other. With a roughly $38 million budget, which was far lower than the budget these types of films usually get, they started filming. When they shot the opening within the division, it was deliberately color-corrected to be a cold blue-gray. That way, the impact of the bursts of red and green in Hong Kong were much more pronounced. They wanted to film on location, and not Canada for Hong Kong. They set up vans on the street where they would film the actors with the locals, unaware that they were in a movie. They shot numerous scenes in crowds in Hong Kong, and even though the locals sometimes saw the cameras, they didn't care. At one point, there was a scene where the villains take Camilla Bell at gunpoint, and the locals continued on like nothing was happening. McWiggan decided to film the entire movie handheld. With the smaller budget, this enabled them to be much more flexible with the shots, 
and they didn't have to waste time with lighting and moving cameras. They also agreed that since they had diminished funds, they would do as many special effects and cameras as possible. Some things like the floating gun were digital, while others, like the exploding fish tanks, were real. The glass in the tanks was plastic, and there was Chris Evans and Dakota Fanning running through them. At one point, a tank exploded prematurely, and Fanning was hit with shrapnel. For the scene where the sniff sees what Nick did with the glass, they superglued it to a metal plate, which they attached to the camera. Since traffic in China was unpredictable, the exteriors in the cars was done with green screens. When Nick is pointing a gun at Henry, the gun's attached to a pole the director's holding and pushing into the actor's head. They worked hard to film in unusual locations far away from the tourist traps in Hong Kong. The Temple of the Dead was a real temple that stayed open while they were filming. They built a fish market set within the real fish market in Kowloon. While working on the film, they discovered The Dark Knight was also being filmed in another part of Hong Kong. While filming in Hong Kong, the director joked with Jaiman because there were places they couldn't film because of the massive billboards of him in an underwear ad. Nate Mooney, who played Pinky, had just starred with Dakota Fanning a few years earlier in Charlotte's Web. The final showdown was filmed on a set to look like the top of a skyscraper being built. They were surprised to discover the scaffoldings around the buildings weren't steel, but instead were bamboo. Bamboo was incredibly strong, as they soon discovered. For the grand finale, they set off an explosion that was supposed to make the entire scaffolding collapse. It only partially dropped. They kept trying, but never got the look they wanted, so with some CG and creative editing, they were able to make it work. The holes in the floor were just black flooring that they added CG extensions into later. After a three-month shoot, the film wrapped. For the opening, since the film was loosely based on real phenomenon and experiments, McWiggan had the beginning sequence shot to look like a documentary with Dakota Fanning narrating. The director and the cast premiered the opening at San Diego Comic-Con, and the crowd loved it. After post, they took the film to screen in front of test audiences. The reaction was all the same. The audiences loved the film, but hated the bleeders. The high-pitched screams caused some people to walk out, although when they were killed, it got the biggest reaction from the crowd. The audiences still wanted to get rid of them, but the director insisted they stay because they were supposed to be irritating. The movie opened on February 6, 2009, in sixth place. It opened against The Pink Panther 2, Coraline, Taken, and He's Just Not That Into You, which took the top spot. It even lost out to the fourth week of Paul Blart Mall Cop. Wildstorm, a division of DC, put out a prequel comic miniseries released alongside the movie. The movie went on to pull in $48 million worldwide, which barely covered its $38 million budget. It made an additional $16 million in DVD sales, which did help, but not enough for the studio to greenlight a sequel. The film was supposed to be part one of a trilogy, complete with somewhat of a cliffhanger ending, but since it underperformed, plans for that were scrapped. William Vince, who had been behind the production from the very beginning, sadly died of cancer in 2008 at the age of 44. He was helping with post-production while he was sick, but never saw the finished film. McWiggan went on to direct Victor Frankenstein, a few episodes of Sherlock, and returned to superheroes by directing a few episodes of Luke Cage. Chris Evans played a superhero for the third time in 2011 as Captain America, which rocketed him into superstardom. Push deserves more credit than it gets. It's a smart, grounded take on superheroes. In a way, it's similar to the X-Men. But by having the characters using extraordinary powers, just not superhuman powers, it set it apart. Filming in Hong Kong and pushing the use of color also helped to make it look different than other movies out there. It's also not just a straight-up action film. There's a lot of character development as they were setting things up for future installments. Some audiences and critics complain the film was too difficult to follow. While it does take a few left turns because of the pushers manipulating thoughts, it all makes sense in the end. Chris Evans said that's one of the reasons why he likes the film, because it's the type you appreciate more when you see it twice. I have to agree. Movies like The Usual Suspects, Memento, and Fight Club are all great first watches, but you like it even better upon the second viewing. You see things from a different perspective, and the movie is even more fulfilling. While Push may not stack up to those other films, it's still a very good, unique take on superheroes. <laughs> Chicky, chicky, who gets us all killed. Are you drunk? Yeah. 
sorry, I didn't know the procedure for stopping a Blitz 10-year-old. I'm 13! 